Institute uh, um, was held uh, in, in the summer of 2021. We did everything online. Um, but still, I think there was like quite a bit of collaboration that went on in small teams after a bunch of trainings, et cetera, that we did. Um, and the last few days of the Institute, people work on like a team project. And so the presentations that we're going to uh, see today through uh, hosted by CSDMS are um, the resulting um, sort of outcomes and findings and like uh, notebooks, so like little codes that people put together and played with, um, and that hopefully are nuggets for others to like either teach with or like do a little bit of like exploratory research with. And so the first project team who is going to uh, present worked on shoreline changes, and they did this very novel thing of coupling uh, CoSat um, satellite products and maps uh, with the coastline evolution model. And so um, this team consisted of Ahmed Dandur, uh, who is in Delft, Benton Franklin at UNC, Connor Lester, Megan Gillen, Meredith Ling, and Sam Zepp. So quite large team. Um, and I'll hand it over to keep us a bit on time to the uh, first presenter. Um, maybe give me a quick heads up because I might might have to make you co-host. Who's gonna present? Yep. Yeah. 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 Can yeah. you share sc screen, uh, Ahmed, or do, oh. um, I think I made your host. Yes, right? I can. Okay, great. Okay. Yes, we're, we're seeing it, great. So, uh, hello everyone, uh, this is Ahmed on behalf of the coastal team. Uh, Benton, Connor, uh, Megan, uh, Meredith, and uh, someone. Uh, so are presenting the simulation of the shoreline change using the coupled cost set, coastline, and the coastal evolution model. Uh, so a brief introduction about what uh, the problem behind our idea that uh, there is around 20% uh, uh, of the earth that is a coastal area. And uh, there is around 45 of the human population live in these coastal areas. And the studies showed that around quarter of the sandy coastal areas are retreating. Uh, so that brings us that we need some future prediction for this uh, coastal area. And in order to do so, there are several ways that can be uh, by the analysis of the shoreline the change uh, over the year, or could be using uh, 2D or 3D models, which need a high computational cost, or could be using uh, physical models, which uh, also need cost, and could be using the simple uh, models or the online models, which is has a reasonable cost and reasonable uh, uh, computational cost. One of these famous uh, sample uh, models, that is the coastal evolution models that was made by uh, Andrew Ashton and Murai and others. Uh, they made this model for uh, to ex in exploratory uh, purpose uh, to explore uh, how the coastal uh, change on, especially on the long term. And as we can see from this simulation, how the space is uh, growing over uh, the years. And this uh, coastal evolution model was already there in the repository of the CSDMS. And another uh, um, um, tool uh, that was made uh, recently, that uh, cost set tool, that was made to uh, extract the shoreline uh, position at any place around the world from uh, the satellite image, like from Landsat 578, Sentinel 2. And it has all images from 1980 till now. So you can just easily and go and just take a short line. So at that point, and that also is written in the Python. So we think, okay, why not we cover these two models that we can go at any place around the orbit, just choose the short line and then run it into the other model, the CEM. And uh, we work it on this idea like this. So we use the cost set tool to get the short lines. And from the shorelines, we construct a bathymetry that uh, we use it for the CEM model. 
and also we use some data uh, that's uh, from some wave boys that also we can access uh, using the uh, Jupyter node to get uh, the wave input for the CEM model, and by that we can run the CEM model. Uh, to apply this uh, idea, we made uh, two. Uh, we made it into two parts. The first part that uh, when we run the uh, the cost set part. So you just go and select uh, the put the coordinates of the area wherever in, in the overlay. You just set the dates of the core line and the shore lines that you want to select the satellite uh, image, and you just give it a name. Then the, the model will, will go to th this area. This is our example that, uh, that we chose the Aries Pit Lake. Uh, the mo model will access uh, the satellite image of this area, uh, as, as you can we can see here. So you look at the satellite image. If you see it clear uh, that you uh, can detect the shoreline, you just click Keep. And then you start to detect the shoreline uh, yourself like this. For example, and then after you finish, you just click enter. If you don't want to add anything, you click in. Then the shoreline will be saved to the GeoJSON format. And then after that, it will turn into uh, uh, the another file that we want to run this CEM uh, part. And also for the historical, with data from that part, we can access uh, the NDVC wave boy by just put uh, the, the number of the station of the wave boy. Then it will, and the year in the range of the years, then it will collect the data. And for the CM model, we just take the mean uh, of this data to run the CM model. For the other part of the running the CM model, that we we put it in another uh, Jupyter notebook. So we we turn the uh, the shoreline that we just draw to a bathymetry using the DM profile uh, rule, and then we adjust the orientation for the model and make some preparation for the domain. Now we have our domain for the model ready to run. And this some setup uh, configurations, some input parameters. Now we almost ready to run our model. Yeah, now the model is running. So now we can see the spit is uh, uh, growing uh, over the 20 years. Uh, here it doesn't look similar to what is happened to reality because we, we still cannot yet uh, represent the structures that protect the spit uh, in reality uh, to, uh, to move. But this is just show a, a, a case if, if there is no uh, structure what would be uh, happen after 20 years. So by that, we can go to any area around uh, the world, just detect the shoreline, and we can uh, see on the long term what could be happening. Uh, for sure, it still needs some work to if when I rec uh, re real predictions. But for now, it could be used as a learning tool. Uh, and so people can learn from it and can maybe look at what is, might go at their local place. Uh, and that's it. And uh, thanks everyone. And I'm happy to uh, open for any question. Thank you so much, Ahmed. Um, I think we have time for one quick question for the um, coastline team. There's a question in the chat by Jara uh, Martinez Sanchez. 
and set, it asks, what's the data source for the initial bathymetry? Yeah, so uh, what, what we do here, we only take the shoreline and then we assume uh, a DIN profile. You, if you are aware of the, the DIN, uh, there is an uh, equation that assumes the, the profile for any uh, coastal area. We just use this uh, theoretical uh, profile and then we just put it everywhere along the shoreline. And from that, we create the bathymetry for the model. Thank you. We hope in the future that will be an easy tool to extract the best metrics, but that is not there yet. And we could be more rare. One more year <laughs> of team project work <laughs> is what I hear. <laughs> yeah. Great. Thank you so much uh, for an excellent presentation and thank you for the whole team for putting this together. And I certainly would know that this will be used uh, in classes because my class has just been running a theoretical CEM model and I'm gonna point them to this resource on GitHub. Um, I'm gonna introduce the next uh, project team. Um, this is Kevin Pierce uh, yeah, of UBC, Laurent Robert, who's at Tulane, and uh, Nishani uh, Moroda, uh, who is at the University of Alabama. And they worked as a team to include wildfires in landscape evolution modeling. And I think all three of them are gonna like present some, if I understood that right. Yeah, so I'm gonna screen share and then Nishani's gonna start. So, uh oh, sorry. Cool. So we are ready whenever you'd like to start, Nishani. Yes, I can start. So our project uh, is focused on modeling the impacts of wildfires on sediment fluxes and landscape evolution. As we all know, wildfires are a major form of disturbance occurring in landscapes. And especially if you're from around Boulder area, wildfires are certainly not a new phenomenon. You may have probably seen the blackish and turbid water that's flowing in streams. Uh, after a fire event. This picture here shows uh, a fire that happened in Boulder in 2020. So during ESPIN, we wanted to use Land Lab to explore how wildfires change the erodibility of the soil and how that impacts sediment fluxes and landscape evolution. For this, uh, we use two standard Land Lab tools, Fastscape Eroder and the space model, both of them are based on solving the stream power equation. So the Fastscape Eroder is a fluvial incision and landscape evolution model, which is relatively fast. And the space is also a model that simulates landscape evolution by river erosion, but specifically it's capable of tracking uh, bedrock erosion and sediment transport on the bedrock simultaneously. So building on the capabilities of uh, both these models, we built a new tool to simulate fire impacts using Land Lab. In this tool, a fire burner is used to generate stochastic wildfires that burn parts of the landscape. And then the erodibility stepper uh, will change the soil erodibility due to the fire. And then a fire plotter is used to visualize the burnt areas on the landscape. Using that, we show how sediment fluxes increase and how the landscape uh, evolves. So next, Laurent will uh, talk about how we implemented that. Yeah, so I will walk through um, these code blocks we have here. We start with uh, an import statement, and then uh, we move on to uh, setting the parameters, things like um, the time step length, the erodibility, uh, and then you can also change uh, the fire frequency, et cetera. Uh, so the first step to build the landscape evolution model is to instantiate the model grid. And here we have a sloped uh, grid that is rough and it's sloped uh, towards the Southwest where we have a single outlet uh, for the watershed. Uh, to make the, wa uh, make the watershed, the landscape, we uh, run uh, the fastscape eroder through a time loop for 2 million years, uh, 
And uh, this is to reach a steady state landscape. Um, uh, so there you can see this is a five by five kilometer grid and we've got some hill slopes and some channels uh, moving down to the outlet point. Um, then to check if we're at steady state, we uh, plot a sediment flux uh, time series at the outlet. Uh, so we have sediment yield here on the y-axis and time on the x-axis. Uh, and as you can see at the beginning, the flux increases a lot as the uh, landscape is evolving. And then eventually after one and a half million years or so, uh, we have a steady sediment flux. So we know we're at steady state and we can uh, add the fires in to see uh, what the effect of the fires is. So we switch over to the space model and we switch our time steps to a single year and uh, we'll run it for a thousand years. So this is much uh, uh, more detailed. Um, and then we run the landscape evolution model. This takes around 10 minutes. So uh, uh, we sort of, we can move on uh, to the, the output. Um, and uh, here is again, a sediment yield through time plot on the top. Uh, and you can see that there are these spikes in sediment yield, uh, and then they slowly decay back to the uh, steady state flux. Uh, and then on the bottom here, we've got fire magnitude. So this is the area uh, of the landscape that's affected by fires. Um, and we can see that the larger fires, these two big spikes, uh, create much larger um, sediment flux signals at the outlet of the watershed. Yeah, and to look at how fires play out across the landscape in more detail, we made a couple of videos. So the first one shows fires occurring alongside landscape evolution. And so you can see that fires have random locations, they have random aerial extent. And when these fires occur, their, their impact on the erodibility of the landscape decays through time. So you can imagine that as the erodibility gets increased in these locations, it causes waves of sediment delivered from rills through channel networks associated with uh, a given fire that occurs. So to look at how that sediment flux plays out, we formed another movie of, um, this, is, this is essentially the sediment flux anomaly. So there's a steady state sediment flux that's occurring in the absence of fire. And when fires occur, the sediment flux goes beyond that. So you're seeing the amount of sediment flux here beyond the steady state flux. And you can see as the fires occur, they light up that portion of the drainage network which is connected to them and we get waves of sediment traveling downstream associated with erosion from fires so looking at this we'll watch it one more time you can imagine that these waves of sediment they travel downstream they affect channel morphology they affect all of the aquatic habitat associated with and adapted to that channel morphology and so what we produced here is kind of a, a first order computational model to understand how sediment delivery from wildfires impacts landscapes and ecosystems. Yeah, so in summary, um, we simulate using LandLab uh, the effects of stochastic wildfires on soil erodibility and how that leads to changes in sediment fluxes and landscape evolution. This tool uh, is suitable to simulate these processes over a range of time scales, uh, probably centennial to millions of years. And we hope that this open access educational tool uh, will be beneficial to students who are interested in learning about fire impacts. And finally, we thank the ESPIN organizers uh, for giving us this opportunity to explore these wonderful research questions. Thank you. Thank you, wildfire team. This, this looks amazing. I, I've been uh, so intrigued by um, the connections that you've made um, sort of with the, um, between the landscape evolution modeling and then like now putting the fires um, into that framework. And yes, it's gonna be like a great visualization tool for like students learning about fires. Uh, but I think there's also quite a bit of research that could still be done with a tool like this. 
Um, we have time for a question. And I see some compliments in the chat, but like hopefully everybody's seeing them now. Can we do it uh, on video? Yes, go for it, Sagi, welcome. Uh, well, this is great work, uh, team, so well done. I'm just curious of how did you uh, control for the effect of the uh, wildfire on the actual sediment change and whether or not it's, um, you think it's fairly realistic, meaning if someone wants to use this for more shorter and modern uh, sediment modeling. Yeah. The, uh, okay, I had the route, sorry. We, we actually, for now, we just, um, we used fairly arbitrary values. Um, so we, we have uh, a change in erodibility that, that you can set. Um, so we set that to a specific value and then it decays over the course of 10 years. Um, but, uh, you know, it, those can be changed to, uh, to realistic values. And it, at short time scales of uh, kind of large oversight in the models that we don't include um, kind of rainfall intermittency. So obviously for the first months after a fire, what really happens to the landscape is dictated by whether it rains or not. And so it's not really applicable over very short time scales, but decadal probably. Thank you. I mean, I think there could also be a little bit of play with that, even if you do it very synthetically, it's like whether the rainstorms like happen like really quickly after um, like exposure of the fires like California right now. And I've been waiting that in contrast with Colorado that has like almost a full snow season and like a little bit of like vegetation recovery and then the like monsoonal rainstorms hit it. So it's sort of a difference that I think you could peak that with like sort of synthetic peak potentially. But like, this is such a good tool to play around with those ideas, I guess. Thank you. And so I should say, um, um, the team was showing this at their like final, like little slide, um, like all of these tools or most of these tools are all like available through GitHub to the ESPIN team repository, but some of them are also like actual labs in the educational repository uh, already. So we can point people to them. The third project team um, worked on landscape uh, scale modeling across a variable slip fault. So like more of a tectonic focus. The team consisted of Grasshopper, who's at the University of Massachusetts, Tavera Aranguis, uh, Judub, Katrina Gelwick, who's at ETH, and Francesco uh, Pavano at Lehigh University, and Josh Wolpert, who's at the University of Toronto. And Tamara um, will be the presenter for this team. And I made Tamara coast, so she should be able to okay. share a screen. Uh, let me see. Are you to see my screen? We do. Okay, perfect. So yeah, good morning, everyone. Um, thanks, Irina, for the introduction. Today, I'm going to be presenting on behalf of my team. Um, that this was our project and as Irina said, our title is Landscape Scale Modeling Across a Variable Sleep Fault. And before I start introducing what we did, I would like to tell you what make us to be together as a group. And it was all of us, we were interested in the role of tectonics in landscape evolution response. So we have started talking about how we can include the tectonics in modeling and because models can help us to figure out what is happening in the landscape. And we decided to focus on strike sleep faults. Um, first, because, well, as you can see here, this is one of the most famous strike sleep fault structures in, that is the San Andreas fault, um, that is a plate boundary. Uh, and strike sleep faults are really important and not just because of themselves, because also other plate boundaries also include the strike sleep faults as a component. So that represents almost 50% of the structures are oblique faults in plate boundaries. So, Considering that strike sleep faults are important and they are complex, analog 
experiments landscape model can help us to visualize these complexities. And the community have been working on developing uh, models. And with this, we decided to focus on one specific work that was published in 2019, developed by Nadine Raymond. Um, this is an open access model that you can uh, find here in Senado. This is how the website looks like. And in this website, you can find all the contents you run the model by yourself. So this is, um, this is a basic model framework that we decided to use because include the lateral motion of the striker slip, also uh, add a complexity that is the discrete earthquakes that is really important in, in active striker slip fault and is based in land lab. That was one of the main takeaways from our summer institution institute. So uh, with this framework, we were asking ourselves like what we can include, what is important in the topography related with tectonic, um, the tectonic role in landscape evolution models. So because we know that strike and sleep faults are complex and strike and sleep faults are understood as mainly lateral motion, but in the reality, they are much more complex than that. And the geometry can be generating oblique faulting that also impact the topography. So our main question to answer with this work was how the oblique faulting impact the topography in a strike slip setting. So these uh, figures here are illustrating how the geometry of a strike slip fault can generate tension in different directions that are accommodating the formation to the strike slip faulting. So we set three learning objectives. First, we wanted to use an open source model in Python that was one of the objectives of our institute. So uh, with this, we can access to open data from other publishes and studies, and the one that we're doing in this case, and you can modify it by your own, uh, changing the parameters. And Jupyter Notebook is a great tool to visualize uh, these cells and the code that we are using. Uh, our second objective was uh, using landscape evolution in active tectonic setting, ad adding in a complexity, in this case, that was the oblique geometry and compare these outputs with what we can find in the natural work conditions. And as a broader impact objective, we wanted to use this notebook as an educational resource where students that are interested in tectonic geomorphology can identify geomarkers and processes that are happening around a strike slip uh, fault settings. So the first part of our notebooks looks like this, where you have to set up your Python environment, import the packages that we're going to use, define the parameters that they call, uh, the model is going to call. The parameters are uh, strike the, the sleep of the fault, um, the time that you want to run the code, how um, the app, regional app lift that was included in the main loop created by Raymond et al. So the first part of our notebook is going to, um, go, go, you can go through the main loop that she created and understand what is happening in the code. Um, but now, because of time, I'm just going to show you what we did, what was our contribution. And with this figure in mind, this is how we um, try to simplify the uplift that was going to happen in the local fault along the fault. So because we knew the size of the grid that we were using in this model, we created a new grid with the same size. And we divided the grid um, in the up part, upper part of the fault and down part of the fault. And we created, um, we divided this along fault in five parts. And because of, we were trying to simplify how this figure looks like, the higher uplift was going to be uh, in the fifth part along the fault, in the north part or upper fault, and in the south part that is down of the fault. So if we see a profile of the uplift that we add, looks like this. So the north part, the peak is around 200 meters. And in the south part, the peak is around 800 meters along fault. Um, so if we visualize this on plan view, if you want to see um, the uplift, this is how it looks like. So the higher uplift is in this. I don't know if you are seeing my cursor here, but the, um, the higher uplift is in the yellow part down in this figure and south uh, to the right. So we again run the main um, loop that Nadine created, and this is the original uplift to the left, and to the right is our uh, output. So you can see that 
obviously something is happening. The topography is very different. This is a set for um, random parameters that we choose. You can change them. It's really easy, nothing complicated. It just make it fast. Um, and you can see that obviously something is happening and this is the differential topography after the simulation. So our uplift along the fault is changing the topography, um, looks something uh, less pretty or more similar to what we can find in the nature. And the same happened with the channel response. So uh, this is how her original output looks like. So we, we see offset channels. She, in this one is illustrating uh, the channels that are connected. And this is how our uh, channel response look like. So it's much more irregular and you start seeing other geomarkers that um, are characteristic of a straight to sleep fault. Um, for the part that we are plotting the channels, uh, we also use landscape land, landlock components, flow accumulator and channel profile that are really useful if you are interested in looking for the response of the drainage network in a straight to sleep fault. Uh, and then, so we moved to the Jupyter notebook as a educational resource. As I show you, this is the topography that we got. This is the channel response that we are seeing in plan view. And if we go through one of the most classic um, resources to, to know about tectonic geomorphology, Birkbank and Anderson 2011 is showing in this figure, um, the geomorphology of a strike -a fault zone. And we can recognize these features in our output. So we can see a chatter ridge in this area. We probably will see a scarp here due to the higher uplift in this region, sac pond that is accumulating water. Uh, about channels, we can see behave channel, offset channels. And in this uh, bottom to the right, we can see one of the processes that is really interesting to a study that is the river capture. So this model can allow you to identify geomarkers. And also if we, uh, because we are compressing the time, we can see how the river capture process uh, work, works in the strike sleep faults. So to summarize, we have three main takeaways. We are using Jup Jupyter Notebook as a tool to run existing open source model with your own parameters and use uh, to visualize what you are running and understand what is happening. Um, we are including a simplified local uplift variability that is generating a different landscape response that is not um, purely lateral. And we can compare with natural work and um, natural work conditions. And our educational impact is related with how you can use this to visualize geological processes as river capture and identify geomarkers uh, that are classic of the strike and sleep fault. That's all. I'm open for questions. Thank you. That was a great talk, Tamara. Um, we can take one. Yeah, I see two participants raise hand. I don't know how to see people who, yeah. Maybe John, you pick no. one there. Yes, great talk. Um, I'm not a geomorphologist, but um, I was particularly interested in this talk. In the presentation, my question is, is do you think the code could be adapted to take the inputs from, let's say, uh, 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 a larger tectonic model with multiple faults and use the velocity field from those multiple faults as an input to the code. Would there be any technical obstacle to that or would that be feasible? Assume, assuming we took the velocity field and imported it into a Python framework, like a new uh -huh. array or something like that. Yeah, uh, so as I understand, if we work with a bigger grid, I'm, I'm sure that we can uh, be able to generate multiple uh, strike asleep faults. Um, in that case, if we, we will obviously add more complexities in terms of uh, the steps that we are connecting the strike slave fault, because the strike slave fault in our grid is, um, is like a complete input in the grid. So I, I, I'm not sure how we can like put a strike slave fault that just end in the half of the grid. So we will have to do something to connect them. And yeah, if we have the input for the velocity field, uh, that's not a, a hard uh, step that we we are already doing that with the, the sleep rate that we are defining for for this for this is a strike a sleep fault. So, yeah, I, I see it as a possible uh, next step for our model. Excellent, very cool.
Thank you for the great presentation. Thank you. Uh, hi, this is uh, Xue Song. Uh, I thought maybe I just speak here because it, it, it take a while to type my question, um, but it's nice work and I might have missed about your tectonic input, but I'm wondering um, for the tectonic uplift and the subsidence, is it only the vertical displacement or it also has the horizontal uh, displacement? Yeah, so uh, how we did our contribution to this model, the model already has the lateral motion, it's purely lateral, and we are not uh, changing that. We are in on that, we are adding a vertical um, motion in, in these two regions that I show you. So the sleep to the side is still happening, we are just adding the vertical motion, but we are keeping the same uh, lateral motion that the strike a sleep fall mm -hmm. has, and we're just changing the vertical motion in these points and uh, extrapolating in between. I see, I see. Yeah, cool. Thank you Thank for you. the questions. Um, it's great to see that like people are here who like are just checking out what the teams have been doing and like um, that the community is here to like see some of what the work that had been done over the summer and maybe make some connections to like ongoing projects too. So. I'm uh, pleased that you're here. Um, we're moving to the fourth team. Um, it was like team climate, <laughs> um, um, consisting of Lisa Madoff, who's at uh, North Dakota, Jakob Hirschberg, who's in Switzerland, and Ali Walter at um, Le Mans Dortoy. Um, and they will speak about paleoclimate and elevation data used to implement the frost cracking window model concept. <laughs> Um, and Risa will be the presenter for this team. And Risa, you can share screen because I made you co-host, hopefully. So she, yeah, we have it. Cool. Risa, you might be on mute. All right, Thanks, <laughs> ready to go. Um, okay, um, I realized um, we were all introduced already. I, I just wanted to go over, um, to, I guess, just the, our backgrounds and how we converged on this topic. Um, I think Ali is, um, has, has worked on subglacial erosion um, and Jakob um, is working on the climate impacts, climate change impacts on um, mass movement, mass movements on alpine in alpine environments. Um, and I'm, I've been working on um, uh, hill slope diffusion and um, climate, um, climate connections. And so um, we, we sort of converged on this in this on this topic where there was already um, a lab set up, um, and so um, I, I guess to, just to give some background, um, um, just about frost cracking. I think everybody is familiar with the concept, um, but it, it, it's you know it's very fun, it's very fundamental, and um, you know for for just basic landscape evolution, it's it's what it's what produces the, um, the basic material that um, degrades landscapes. Um, and early work of Anderson um, pr provided the um, a sort of frost cracking window, um, the temperatures at which um, the, the process of freeze thaw acts. Um, and then the intensity is the amount of time that the rock would spend in that, in that window uh, and then since then, um, there's, there's a lot of research that's been going on. Um, uh, Hales and Roaring looked at climate variations um, at the interglacial glacial um, time scale um, and saw that, um, again, climate is playing a significant role in, in denudation in alpine landscapes. And um, Jill Marshall continues on the research with, um, with there being strong temperature control on surface processes. And so um, it's pretty clear that climate um, is impacting um, at least weathering in, in um, 
in cold, alpine, glacial, interglacial timescale landscapes, changing climates. Um, for weather, and, it, and all of that is important for weathering erosion and natural hazards. Um, and so we, um, we sort of, our, our diverse backgrounds have, had to have some kind of common threads. Um, and we, our, our basic question um, is, is about how we can use past climate records to model and teach about frost cracking, um, these frost cracking windows, um, because it, it, it's, it's reasonable that in, in different locations with different kinds of climates, maybe different climate pasts, um, there are going to be different different ranges of those windows. Um, and then since that's impacting degradation and hazards, that, that would be something really good to know. Um, and, and also, I guess, connecting it to, um, I guess, the, the framework of, of, of using these Jupyter notebooks, um, how, um, how do we initiate those really new to this approach altogether? Um, and so um, I guess this presentation is a little different than the previous three um, in that I guess there's, there's a lot that goes, there's a lot of prep, I think, that's needed before even you start thinking about coding, like what, what, is, what is going on in the computer before um, you can start thinking about how to put together a model. Um, and so um, I guess it, I, I brought in um, Greg Tucker's lab um, to just just to I guess show that um, we we incorporated uh, you know the basic sort of core parameters for um, how soil and temperature um, how soil and temperature interact um, and how temperature change um, changes changes that frost cracking um, depth um, and so this this is a this is something in the labs that anyone could go to, and and we we um, we use the code for that um, as, as sort of the basis of our model. Um, except at this at this um, for this lab, the changes are just going on daily and seasonally, and we wanted to incorporate um, climate a climate data set for the for for paleoclimate. Um, and then for specific locations. And so that, that's sort of where things got a bit more complex. Um, and so I, I sort of put together a conceptual workflow of, of sort of what's needed. Um, if anybody wants to put together um, a, a model to do this, because well, I'll, 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 I'll say what we did um, and, sh and like hopefully inspire you to go further with this. But um, you know, there's the idea of a computational grid and you know, others have mentioned it, and that that's sort of central. It's how um, you know, it's how the results will vary across space and time. And so it's it's what the computer uses to think. So it's 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 doing the work for us, so that we don't have to you know have have a spreadsheet and do it by hand. Um, and then, and so with this, with this grid, um, I mean, each 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 computational process is going through each cell. Um, and, and then there are sort of rules relating to how each cell is going to relate to the next cell. And I realize for those of you experts in, in, um, in, in programming and um, in Python and such, um, you know, th this, this is very basic, but for those who, who haven't done it, this is sort of what's going on behind the scenes. Um, and, and so um, we made use of a land lab component, um, sort of, sort of this, this provided the skeleton for this, and then Python tools. But it, it's really just applying a finite difference approach, and it's just relating the different cells to each other. Um, and and we, and so we used, um, but what we added to to sort of this the basics was um, elevation from a specific location, and then temperature temperatures um, through time. And we used um, PMEP6, which is a paleo, um, paleo climate model. And, um, and so I guess in general, um, someone could either use make up their own model grid or as what we did, we imported a DEM and, and then we had to code for change of slope for each cell. 
Um, and, and also in each cell, each cell um, is, is having, is getting to read a temperature um, at, through a time series. Okay, so each, each cell is, is computing um, one, one, one dimensional heat diffusion equation and um, for a certain elevation, because changes in elevation will affect the change in temperature um, locally. Okay. Um, and so I guess the, the complicating factor is adding for um, time series on, on the order of, you know, thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of years, whatever your model has it. And, and so um, I, I'm not really showing code from our notebook because we, we still have to um, make adjustments to generalize some of the code so that someone could input their own climate model data, temperature data. Um, and so th this is just showing um, sort of the initiation, initiation, pro initiation states for each cell um, in elevation and then in temperature. And so um, each cell is reading is, is reading like a package of data that is getting input and then computing it through time. Okay, so, um, and then the end result was we, you know, we, we had a, a location, but we only computed it for a single cell. Um, and then at a certain time for a single time, because um, we, we didn't, um, we, we didn't go far enough to be able to, to, com to compute it for the, the entire um, time period and for a, for a whole like watershed that we had. Um, but, but, if, but this is showing you just how much more complex even just for a single cell is compared to um, the, the, original, um, the original model uh, that was shown here before. Um, and so what this is showing is we, we computed a window, a place-based window um, frost cracking window. So this is the temperature range um, that frost cracking would occur. Okay, and then the other concept is a frost cracking index. And so that's the time spent at, at each depth through time. Okay, so um, again, we're, this is just one point in time for a single cell. And this is showing the, the index for that. Okay, so um, th th this is where we this is where we got, um, and we there's still more work to do to at least generalize the code more, um, and and so just this is kind of in summary as to like what what are the learning objectives you could do with any of this, and so I just came up with some general and then specific. Um, so in general, I th I think what the big idea what the big ideas are are using real world gridded data, um, and applying it to a physical physics-based model, um, quantifying change through time using um, a, a real a real world time series data. And um, I guess, I don't know if this is more advanced or just like, it depends if what level course you're teaching, um, finding relevant resources and importing it to answer a question. And, and then depending on the objectives of a course, how much programming you want students to have um, or, or do themselves as opposed to importing all the data for them and having them just sort of answer questions based on the outputs. Um, yeah, I think I'm gonna. Am I, am I over? Yeah. I'm sorry. Wow. Okay. That's all right. I, uh, yeah. I okay. didn't get you started like quite on time, but like. Okay. Uh, yeah. Um, okay. For the sake of time. Uh, we'll... Yeah, I didn't realize. It. Yeah, it, it just seems to go. Okay. Um, yeah. Um, so I, but... I'm just. I'm done. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> Thank you, Risa. Um, yeah. I encourage people to like um, ask you questions also in the chat or ask the team oh, questions. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay. So like maybe keep an eye on the chat and then we will be moving to the team that works on um, okay. Okay. storms and erosion. Um, this is on Angel Monsalve, Sam Anderson, Sophia Alfeus, uh, and Mur Muriel Bruckner. Marielle Nesson and Grace Gurion. Um, so quite a large team and I was the presenter if I um, have my notes right.
Yes. Uh, we see your screen on Joe. Yes. Okay, perfect. Thanks. Um, hey, well, thanks you're Aspen for... Church. <laughs> yeah, sure, of course. <laughs> Good job. Um, uh, thanks for the invitations. Um, um, I'm presenting on behalf of my team. My name is Angel Monsalve. And we played a little bit with um, with storms and rainfall. So our presentation is how those storm intensity, duration, and frequency influence uh, river channel and in, in, incision. And this is, of course, uh, the results that uh, from from the summer school, which was pretty 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 good. So um, I'll I'll try to summarize most of the of the results because of in terms of time. Um, I don't know what's, oh yeah, there it goes. So uh, our particular project uh, was um, trying to combine the uh, erosion, uh, but as a result of um, rainfall. So we know that the uh, landscape evolution in particular uh, channel, channel morphology depends on hydrolog hydro hydrologic processes, but all the variability that uh, that hydrologic processes has, including geology, soil conditions, weather, uh, well, almost everything varies, especially so it's very very difficult to include all these variables in a model. So at a, a small scale or, or at a local scale, this is very very challenging, and we try to uh, include. Uh, some of the most, or what we think is the, uh, are the most uh, important components. So uh, first we, um, the most uh, important part that we, or that what we thought it, it would be important is to have um, different types uh, of different scenarios of rainfall. And that's what we applied into, in a couple of simulations that I'm going to show um, here. Uh, so the objective, or uh, sorry, I have. Uh, oh, no, that, this is good. Uh, so the objective or our, our, our uh, actually it was not developing a code. Uh, actually, coupling different models uh, was to build this model that uh, illustrates how different precipitation patterns produce different erosion patterns. Okay, so. Um, the most of uh, landscape evolution models uh, assume constant steady flow state of water in channel, which is really nicely described in this figure uh, adapted from Adams uh, in 2017, uh, which basically uh, most of the models, what they do uh, are uh, or is to consider a certain uh, rainfall event and calculate based on that magnitude also so what that means is that when the the, um, the rain uh, stops the all the processes stops and, and we know that that is not true in the in nature so after the rainfall stops it continues flowing through the catchment and uh, erosion and other processes still continue happening so this is what we we were trying to explore in 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 our when we were coupling these different models so we use the overland flow um, component in land lab. Uh, we were in, in all the team members were somehow related with river. So this particular uh, component was really um, nice to first to learn how to use it and then uh, 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 actually use it in different situations. So the, the model is nice for um, for long term simulation because it it's really fast, it's really stable, and it's uh, after a little uh, studying, it's easy, relatively easy to use. So uh, we were really happy when when we uh, were able to use this component. So the the, the model is a two D model. Um, uh, it allows us for long term uh, um, uh, modeling, as, as I told you before, and it's uh, based basically on a DM or di digital elevation model, uh, a certain roughness. So some uh, of the most important characteristics of a, of a given watershed are included uh, in, the, um, in, in this component. Uh, 
one big difference is, uh, or one big advantage of this uh, component is that we don't have to define the tunnels. The tunnels are uh, basically uh, a result of water uh, flowing through the model. So that is really, really uh, nice. The other component, it's the detachment limited erosion. Um, uh, so this is the part that takes the input from the, from the uh, uh, water source. Uh, from the previous one, from the overland flow, and erodes the um, the the basin. Okay, so it's uh, the nice thing about this particular um, component is that it actually uses the discharge as an input to erode instead of the the drainage uh, area, which is basically uh, which is typically done and for long term simulations. Um, we are still working on the spatial precipitation distribution because we need to, the, the, the challenge there is to uh, modify the source code in the overland flows to make it, uh, to make it spatially. In, in our case, all our, all our uh, storms are uniform across the, the whole watershed, but we are making some good progress in, in, in that part. I, I hope that it will, uh, soon will be available for everybody. Um, the, so it, uh, the simulations what uh, we did are ideal uh, models or, or some idealizations of a square basin, uh, which is really, it has a steep gradients uh, and a, re a really short in time. So because it, it takes a long, long time for uh, for this model to, I mean, computational time to, to model when when we wanted to uh, simulate um, this type of uh, rainfall events. So I'm going to show uh, three different uh, rainfall events. The, the things, so the, basically they have the same amount of water between them. Uh, but they differ in the intensity and the duration. And I uh, and it should be okay. So it's really it's really subtle the the, the difference in the animation. But I, I'll try to explain why it's that happening. So first of all, uh, okay. Now that you saw the first <laughs> uh, movie. Uh, the, all the events have they have the exactly same amount of water, so we are um, taking that variable out of the of the of the result. So, um, but if you see here the uh, in the upper panels, you see the um, how the flow is um, uh, routing through the watershed. So I'll try to make a, a case here. Where this is in time uh, 120, uh, excuse me, uh, 1200 seconds. So it, it will be around here. I don't know. Oh, I don't think you can see my pointer. Oh, I, I don't see it. Okay, whatever. Um, so the, the thing is, is um, you can see that the, the response in the different watersheds, it's uh, different. And that also affects. Uh, so these are the three cases. Uh, okay, and this is the the hydrograph uh, at the uh, watershed uh, outlet. So all of them are uh, different. Basically, they they follow up similar shape of the rainfall event. But the nice thing is that they vary in time, which is one thing that we really wanted to include. And the incision rates are almost also uh, the same shape um, as the rainfall event and the, the, um, and the hydrograph. So, but something that is really important here is not really to see the incision rate, but to see the uh, areas of the incision. So that will tell us how much incision uh, happened. Uh, so uh, in this figure, you can see that all of them, uh, although the different um, rainfall events have different responses, which is something that we wanted to show. And, on, and this is the incision at the watershed. So 
I apologize for the for they looked very different, but it's because of the scale of the watershed. Um, um, so it's it's really I tried several <laughs> uh, combination of uh, uh, color maps and but this was the the one that it was better. So uh, what is surprising that it was the the rainfall intensity that it, it was um, the 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 smaller one but with larger duration had. Uh, larger incisions. So that was really, really cool to, to observe in, in this uh, case. Also, um, oh, also uh, we, we tried um, with different frequencies. So uh, the, the rainfall will start and stop, start and stop and several times to see uh, what's the, the effect on that. And, and of course it, it affects uh, yeah. And also we have some, some these really nice uh, patterns. I'm, I'm sorry that I can't show you, I can show the, the, the mouse, but uh, this really wavy uh, um, responses, which is really uh, cool. Um, the sources and the, all the codes will be available. I didn't have the time to upload them, but uh, they are uh, of course running because I, <laughs> I was able to get those Figure. So uh, if I think I was pretty quick, so if anyone has any question, please uh, let me know. Joe, you were pretty quick, but like I was like late in the previous talk. So like we're going to still like refer people a bit to the chat and hopefully a few people will hang um, at the, towards the end and like ask questions then still too. Um, <laughs> And um, we'll move on to the team that works on simulating of sediment pulses in the land, land, work, land lab network sediment transporter. Um, this was Xi Zhong Cho, uh, Munir Maha, Marius Huber, and Nel Guiro. And Xi Zhong will be the presenter today. Great. So our team will talk about network sediment transporter, a land lab component that tracks sediment from its source transport um, and fate across the entire network, uh, ent entire stream network at any time step we define. Oh, okay, <laughs> all right. So sediment is usually introduced from erosion of hill slope or within and near um, a stream network and the river generally moves downstream to the sink. Sounds simple enough. But still, sediment transport is one of the most complex and challenging problems in geomorphology. And that is due to um, wide ranging processes that define sediment transport and storage. Um, and, and those processes depend on multiple environmental factors, including particle size, channel and, channel and floodplain morphology, and energy of alluvial system. For example, coarser. Um, size sediment like sand and gravel travels on river bed by rolling, sliding, and skipping, while finer particles sediment gets picked up by turbulence of water and moves down, downstream in suspension. So there are different um, you know, uh, transport processes and sometimes sediment gets trapped um, in a river system. So its residence time can range from seconds to thousands and million, millennia years. So you can see how varying those processes are. NSD particularly um, deals with bed load transport. Um, and we care about sediment transport because channel morphology, stability, and aquatic habitat, as Kevin talked about earlier, all depends on sediment transport. In addition to um, the threats, both human and natural infrastructure. And we care about that because we live in a world um, of fast transition and large scale landscape disturbance, both human and natural. Human in this disturbance like agricultural development, urbanization, mining, um, uh, and logging all can introduce huge amounts of sediment to stream and affect sediment transport downstream. Um, there's also natural events like wildfire, like Kevin's team and Lawrence's team have talked about, um, and, and flooding and landslide, which have become exacerbated by climate change. So it is really important that we understand sediment transport processes and have the capability to make predictions in order to prevent and mitigate um, negative impacts of those landscape disturbances. So our project um, objectives are twofold. 
First is to demonstrate a potential to couple network sediment transport with other existing land lab models that can generate sediment sources or simulate other sediment input conditions. And secondly, run NST with random pulses of sediment to understand um, you know, build a predictive capability to see how sediment moves through the network and so that we can begin to understand the impact of landscape disturbance and sediment yield. So I'm going to go to my uh, our Jupyter notebook. So I'll first talk about the first objective and then second one. First objective is nicely illustrated by this conceptual model. We want to couple um, other land lab components like space, like that could generate uh, landscape evolution as a as a result of fire occurrences. And now I'm seeing um, Angal's um, presentation, rainfall erosivity, long-term simulation will change the landscape topography. And that, you know, it will be really interesting to couple that with network sediment transporter to see how the, the in-stream channel processes are affected by long-term evolution of rainfall erosivity. So the connecting tissue of other land lab model to NST is DEM, digital elevation model. So we started working with, you know, um, Shelby, who really great, gave us a lot of help to um, develop uh, a function um, to convert DM to uh, network grid because NST operates on network grid, not landscape topography. So, um, for example, we have received this DM from Space Team, and we decide to. Uh, run a model that can convert the DEM to network grid. Uh, so create network from raster is a function that does exactly that. So it looks good. It creates nodes and links from the DEM. So we were like, all oh, right, it's going to work. Um, and then we discover a bug um, that actually duplicates some of the links between some of the nodes. So we have more number of links than nodes, which is you know preventing us from running NST. Um, so we stop on that part, but we're continuing to work with Shelby and Eric to debug that model because there's still, I feel like there will be a lot of utility in a function that could create network grid from DEM for not only NST, but other land lab component that operates with the, the uh, network grid as a foundation for model, um, uh, model uh, execution. So from here on, I'm gonna move on to objective two, which is to run NST with um, randomly generated sediment parcels, um, simulating the effects of fire and landslide using um, example shape files. So we use method subbasin, which is included in the land lab library um, when you uh, download that package. Uh, so, but you know, it's a shape file. We still need land lab um, in order to learn NST. We need a network grid. A uh, rich shape file is a function that converts the shape files to network grid and picks up some of the attributes that are included in the shape file. Um, so um, running the read shape file, we have converted the um, shape file to network grid with the links and nodes. And now we have right number of links and nodes. There should be one more nodes and links um, as it should. And it also picked up some of the uh, physical attributes from the shape file like rich length, drainage area, and topographic elevation, which are important factors in calculating sediment transport. But we still need some additional, topogra uh, additional topographic and hydrologic information to run NST. So here we define the bedrock elevation based on topographic elevation and assign some arbitrary channel width and flow depth. The meat of our objective two is um, the ability to introduce additional sediment pulses in our network um, grid. Um, so we have done that by creating random sediment parcels and data record um, using truncated normal distribution. So this histogram shows you know, how many numbers of parcels that we're creating for the link. So we have an array of randomly generated sediment parcels. Now we can assign the random sediment parcels to the links, um, which will be tracked using element ID for all of the links at each time step moving forward. Um, and then once we have the array, we have to def um, we also need to define some sediment characteristics like set, set grain size distribution, um, uh, and and, and, um, and 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 so that we can track the each parcel um, downstream as it move move forward in time. But in order to track sediment, we have to classify parcels as either active or inactive. You know, the sediment that are on the top layer are active, 
and buried are inactive. Um, and active parcels are, are, are the most recent parcels to arrive in length, so it's important to track which are active and which are not active. Um, and um, the, the active parcels are moved downstream using a sediment transfer formula. Um, for this, we use Wilcott Crow, which is a bed load um, equation. Remember, NST currently only does do um, bed load. Uh, it's a bed load equation designed for a well-graded, poorly sorted river containing both sand, sand and gravel. So now we can begin assigning each parcel an arbitrary arrival time and location and link. Um, and now that we have all the elements defined, we can now collect those arrays into dictionary of variable, which will be entered into NSD uh, model formulation. And, and, and in order to run the sediment transporter, we have to define some time steps um, and we run it. Uh, and then once we have the time steps, we enter the variables that we already defined um, and then we can, we can run the model forward in time. All right, I, I rushed through this, 10 minutes so short. Um, now I'm gonna show you some of the model results. Um, uh, there are LEMLAB plotting tools specific to NST. Um, in particular, plot network and parcels create plan view map of network parcels and links. Um, we can color them both. So first I thought it would be interesting to just kind of look at how much sediment is generated in different links. So at time step zero, um, at link 18, we can see that there are um, a volume of sediment that's created. Um, another example, if you look at or, um, the link 25, which is here, we have generated some sediment at time step zero. Um, and, 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 you know, I wanted to create animation, but I didn't have the computational savvy to do it. But, okay, this is time step zero. And if we move to time step five, we see that the sediment that was generated in link 25 has moved from first order stream to second order stream. And then the final terminal time step, it has moved further down on the second stream. So that's really cool. But we can also plot all the parcels um, using the same plotting tool. So here we see at time step zero, all the parcels that's created in all the links that we defined here um, at time step zero. And when you move to time step five, we can see that a lot of the parcels have moved downstream and some of them exited the um, network at, at time step 10. Um, further move downstream. Um, there are some not networking plotting we did just, you know, as we can see that as the time moved forward, we had less number of volumes as we, as um, one would expect. Um, and same with um, uh, this plot is showing uh, the, the cumulative distance versus grain size. So it means that larger the grain size, less distance it traveled um, as one will expect. So it, it's it's generating um, results that are reasonable. We're not done yet. I mean, I feel like this is a continuing work. Um, first, we want to complete the modeling framework to couple more than one land lab component. And after today's presentations, I feel like there's other ways to connect with other teams to see how um, how you know how we might model and make predictions on um, uh, how rivers transport sediment downstream that results from long-term evolution of landscape, either from uh, tectonic events, rainfall events, fire, landslide like highlands. Um, so we're gonna continue to work on um, debugging that function that translates DM to network grid. And secondly, um, we want to develop a suspended solid load algorithm to append to current NST um, right now uh, only handles bed load. Um, and, and reason for that is water quality concerns are you know, largely on suspended solid loads. So it will be interesting to add that capability to NST and we'll have a huge scientific value. Okay, I'm done. Thank you for a great presentation, Xiu Yong. And um, this network transporter is such like a novel um, Im implementation in the uh, land land lab framework that it's been great that your team kind of picked that up and has been working on it and i agree i could see the linkages with other teams too i'm going to give the floor to the last team that um worked on simulated uh sim simulating craters on planetary surfaces and this team consisted of emily bamber who's at ut austin and gaia stuki de k who's now at harvard and emily is the presenter
Hi everyone, it's so nice to see everyone from Aspen again, all your lovely faces. Uh, <laughs> I'm excited to close out with what is probably a bit of a different kind of thing from um, the rest of the presentations, which are based on um, kind of fluid transport and stuff. So um, Gaia and myself uh, are geomorphologists, I would say, um, but we, um, I am mainly looking at the surface of Mars and, and Gaia has in the past as well looked at the surface of Mars and other planets and we're interested in other planets as well. Um, and so we wanted to, um, during the ESPIN uh, Summer Institute, we wanted to build um, something that could mesh well with Land Lab so we could run landscape evolution models but, but we're on a created kind of background terrain um, as, a, as a sort of initial condition. So, um, what is an impact crater? It's just a uh, depression basically in the surface and it has usually has a high standing rim around it. So here's a photo of Meteor Crater in the USA and also they can be giant structures like Schrodinger Crater on the moon, which you know is a, a quarter of an eighth of the moon's surface or something ridiculous. Um, and why do we really care about impact craters? Why do we want them in our landscape evolution models? So they're actually maybe the main geomorphic agent on every surface except Earth, and they probably were important in, in early Earth's evolution as well. Um, and so for the surfaces that aren't affected by plate tectonics or everything's been overprinted, um, the craters from the past still exist, but they've been affected by landscape processes. So we can't necessarily use that as an, as an initial condition, but we want to kind of go back and reconstruct the initial crater topography as a kind of input to, to a landscape evolution model. Craters are also really important for dating surfaces. Um, and so a kind of future aim of this work, we haven't got around to this yet, is to kind of uh, be able to um, use the number of craters and size distribution of them as like dating for our model as well to kind of integrate that with time steps of like normal, because um, it's kind of a random process. Um, um, yeah, and they also, um, record um, solar system evolution um, throughout time. Um, there can be at any scale. So uh, meteor crater is what, like a kilometer across, I think, or something. And then you saw Schrodinger crater. So these are really like at lots of different scales and they can be really important whether you're looking at kind of um, small scale things at like uh, kilometer scale to, you know, global scale um, kind of things on planetary surfaces. And uh, the reason we're interested in kind of the geomorphology, hydrology of craters um, is really because they may have also been host to alien life and they're key to understanding the past um, kind of surface environment. Like I'm personally studying how did rivers form into these craters? So I wanna run landscape evolution models um, kind of on a created landscape and find out um, how um, inlets are forming and, and what we can understand about them because it all has implications for the habitability of lakes and water that was hosted inside the craters as well um, which is like Jezero crater which here in this animation is filled with water which is where Mars is 2020 um, Perseverance River is now exploring in the delta there so pretty cool stuff there's lots of reasons to study it um, and the main problem is that there currently isn't um, an open source accessible code to generate a created surface um, there's lots of codes that generate like an individual crater and I think because I downloaded this presentation it doesn't link to the nice video that would have been here um, but uh, there's lots of videos uh, there's lots of simulations to simulate a crater and how the ejector around a crater forms which is just the kind of material that the crater um, or meteor blows out as it creates the crater um, and Lang Lab is such an amazing powerful tool and you'll all uh, all adding like even more to this. It's so exciting um, that, you know, I want to be able to use some of that, <laughs> basically. Um, so yeah, so there is a, a model, landscape evolution model that exists called Mausim um, from the Alan Howard's group. Um, it's been around for 20 odd years now, um, but it's written in Fortran. And I love Python. Uh, I'm not sure I want to learn Fortran. Um, Landlab originally also did have a cratering component, but it seems it wasn't um, updated into uh, like subsequent releases um, and updates of, of um, 
the source code. And then um, there's also, we found some like cratering kind of things on, on GitHub, but they deal with this thing called crater saturation, which is kind of measuring until what surf until like what time, how many craters do you accumulate on a surface until, you know, at the point you're adding one, you're also obscuring another one. So you're not adding any more craters to the surface. It's kind of reached its kind of maximum uh, geomorphic age that it, it can display. Um, but they don't deal with like the topography of the craters. So we wanted to add um, that in so we could um, model the evolution of, a, of the topographic surface. And so the basic idea behind this is just to, um, the, it's taking work done by Alan Howard um, and basic writing it, uh, coding it in Python. So um, the initial, the, the shape of the crater is already defined by a few equations. Um, and so we can actually <laughs> set the um, inside of the crater has a shape that can be um, defined by a like, polynomial fit. And that's based on um, uh, data taken from a lot of planetary surfaces of, of fresh, of where there are fresh craters, such as the moon, and that haven't been affected by a ton of uh, geomorphic processes. Um, and then um, there's also a shape for the rim and outside of the crater uh, that can be fit by a separate thing. So we just kind of can set the radius um, of the, of the crater and what's inside it versus what's outside and, and has a, a different equation to, to describe the shape, um, and which will include the ejector blanket as well, which is that blanket of material that gets deposited of the stuff that gets ejected from the crater. Um, oh yeah, and then here's the, the actual like, equations that can be used. Um, what we wanted to do um, in the notebook that we wrote and the code overall is um, model the shape. So go from just like saying there's a crater here to actually having the shape of the crater imposed on the landscape and um, have a uh, population which reflects how craters um, are formed. So they actually, um, it's a random process, you know, what, what's gonna uh, impact the planetary surface um, differs uh, on a, a bunch of things. So it's coming from a population of like asteroids or comets um, and uh, randomly hitting the surface at random points in time. So we wanted to kind of simulate that stochastic process um, and have a population of craters on the surface. Um, and then eventually um, what we want to do with this code is um, run some of the land lab um, components on it, such as uh, the detachment erosion and, and all the things that you've all been talking about <laughs> um, to see how that evolves over time. And that was written a bit into the, the lesson we produced as well. And so um, I can actually post the link to this in the chat. So this is the um, like lesson that's now live on the CSDMS website. So you can actually go and check out the, the notebook on there that we have in the lesson and talks you through like every aspect of the code we've written. There's nothing kind of left out of that um, and talks about you know, how we choose from a, a uniform, um, sorry, how we choose the locations from a uniform distribution on, on the square grid, um, but we choose uh, the, the shape, it's like a cumulative distribution because you have more smaller craters than you would have larger craters. It's kind of displaying all that information so um, you can like digest it and understand how we're simulating um, this very random process in the shapes of the craters. Um, yeah, and I can, I will stop here. I was going to talk through the notebook, but in interest, I know that everyone didn't have questions and stuff. So maybe we can have a time for questions for like everybody at the end of this. But it's better for everyone. <laughs> I think that Thank you. Thank you, Emily. This is such good work. And uh, it was like really nice to see that like come like all together and like it's been up for a little while. And I think people are probably like using it. I know like some people are teaching notebooks and like are using some of the repo notebooks so um very cool yeah that's super cool and if you do end up using it at any point or wanted to use it for a lesson and have any questions like please reach out i'd be happy to or any comments as well like i'd be happy to see how we that's a it. that's a very <laughs> very da dangerous offer <laughs> um I mean, we're coming to like sort of the conclusion of the official part, and I'm hoping that some people will stick around for a few questions to each other. Um, but like, I realized like, you know, like we all like are trying to like sort of like pack our days and um, go from Zoom to Zoom. 
or from class to class or however the situation is for everyone. Um, I'm gonna keep the Zoom open for about like 10 more minutes or so. So that's if people are um, keen to like ask a quick question, then they can do that. Um, but otherwise I wanted to like thank everyone. Like I wanna thank everyone for just attending and uh, providing uh, some feedback to the, to the uh, ESPIN teams and uh, being there for questions. And I especially wanted to thank the uh, 2021 ESPEN participants uh, and presenters for today uh, who are willing to like sort of step it up and like share their, uh, their latest and greatest. So thank you everyone. And these team projects are always so impressive to us. So like we're really like proud to see uh, how far along they get in just a few days of people like really focused uh, work and then like some work like still like going on afterwards for like many of you. So thank you everyone.